filling the position. President Donald Trump names a new national security advisor. We'll tell you about Robert O'Brien. Gun control. The attorney general makes an appearance before lawmakers. We're on Capitol Hill. Fight for the unborn. Analysis of a new study saying abortions in the U.S. have fallen to their lowest level in more than 40 years. And speaking out, what a Republican senator from Indiana says about the discovery of baby remains at the home of an abortion doctor. On EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, September 18, 2019. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you for joining us for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Wyatt Goolsby. President Donald Trump has named a new national security advisor. Robert O'Brien previously worked as a hostage negotiator in the State Department. He also has worked with George W. Bush and Barack Obama administrations. He replaces John Bolton, who was dismissed from the position last week following disagreements over policy issues. President Trump says homelessness is destroying cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. He's considering a new task force to tackle the issue. The president is spending a second day in California where government officials hope they can find bipartisan solutions. White House correspondent Mark Irons reports. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Wyatt. The governor of California and several mayors in the state say they are willing to work with President Trump but they are critical of his administration's proposed cuts to public housing. Today, we also heard from Catholic officials about how they are dealing with this issue of homelessness, a problem in the U.S. that goes beyond California. President Trump says the prestige of U.S. cities is being destroyed by homelessness. In California, to fundraise for his reelection, the president is targeting the state for its high number of homeless people living, as he says, on our, quote, best highways, our best streets, our best entrances to buildings. Nearly half of all the homeless people living in the streets in America happen to live in the state of California. What they are doing to our beautiful California is a disgrace to our country. And people are living on the streets across the country here in Washington, D.C. as well. The Trump administration says it's the city with the highest overall level of homelessness. A White House report released this week gave its reasons for increased rates of homelessness, including the higher price of housing due to overregulation of housing markets and expanding supply of homeless shelters as a substitute for affordable housing, personal factors like mental illness and substance abuse, and a city's tolerability for people sleeping on the street. Responding to reports that the Trump administration is looking to move homeless people off the streets and into federal facilities, the National Coalition for the Homeless pushed back, saying federal efforts to criminalize homelessness or to create warehouses to move the homeless out of sight and out of mind are clearly not the answer. Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson traveled to California yesterday, calling for solutions that go beyond politics. What we really need to do is focus our attention on how are we going to actually solve this problem and not make it into a political football. We heard from Catholic Charities of Los Angeles today. It currently runs nine shelters for people who are homeless. The group says its goal is to move individuals and families away from homelessness to self-sufficiency through case management, supportive services, and that includes housing. White, White House correspondent Mark Irons reporting. Thanks, Mark. The Senate confirms a Catholic to be Assistant Secretary of State. However, the final tally was divisive, as all present Democrats and one Republican voted no to Robert Destro. When asked about the requirement that insurance plans cover contraception, his response was, quote, the idea you're entitled to have someone pay for your birth control is kind of ridiculous. Bob Destro will oversee the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. The Catholic University law professor has a track record of defending religious freedom, unborn life, and traditional marriage. He also represented the parents of Terry Schiavo. All eyes are on the White House waiting for President Trump to release his plan on gun control. A White House spokesman says it could be very soon. Six weeks have passed since more than 30 people were killed in a string of mass shootings, and the debate is heating up on Capitol Hill. Correspondent Jason Calby reports. Jason? Wyatt, Congress hasn't been able to pass anything on gun reform, not after Sandy Hook, not after Parkland, not now. And the president has threatened to veto a House pass bill to expand background checks 
to all gun sales. Still, senators say they're hopeful they can pass something. Lord, give our lawmakers the wisdom to look to you for safety. Prayer and work. We are on the cusp of clear progress on gun violence prevention. The number two Senate Republican tells me the president is coming up with a proposal. Trying to find uh, a path forward that would uh, provide meaningful answers and solutions and try and prevent this type of violence from happening in the future is the goal. The Senate Majority Leader says they're waiting. I've said repeatedly that we need some guidance from the president about what kind of proposal that would make a difference he would actually sign into law. Democrats say Republicans don't have to wait. The Republican leadership's idea of a holding pattern is really a betrayal of our constitutional responsibility to act without necessarily requiring the president to say he's going to sign this legislation. Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Leader Chuck Schumer warn for them to support any gun control proposals, they need to include background checks for all sales. Besides laws, social media companies, there's more they can do. Senators asked Facebook, Twitter, and Google Senator what they're doing to keep people safe. We have a credible threat that something, someone is at risk, um, either to others or themselves. We work with the FBI to, uh, to ensure they have the information they need. They were able to then intervene and in many cases save lives. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham says he thinks the president's proposal will include some expansion of background checks as well as some element of a red flag. This is where a judge can take away guns from someone deemed to be a threat to themselves or others. Wyatt? Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvey reporting. Thanks, Jason. Officials from Saudi Arabia say Iran was behind last weekend's attack on the kingdom's oil industry. The Saudi Defense Ministry showed the remains of the missiles they say were launched from Tehran. On Twitter, President Trump says he plans to increase sanctions against Iran. Tehran denies responsibility and says any action from the United States will, quote, face an immediate answer. There's still no clear winner in Israel's national election. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu appears to be tied with his main rival for control of the 120-seat legislature. Final results are expected in the coming days, but Netanyahu says he wants a chance to lead a ruling coalition with his religious and nationalist allies. In the midst of this uh, 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 endgame or negotiations on, uh, uh, on, on Brexit, there will be a clear position uh, by uh, the new uh, elected uh, parliament. Lawmakers in Europe approve an extension for Britain's departure from the European Union, but first the United Kingdom has to ask for the extension. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said he would like to leave by October 31st with or without a deal. The Vatican's criminal prosecutor is seeking to charge a one-time seminarian accused of sexually abusing younger seminarians who lived inside the Vatican. Father Gabriel Martinelli is accused of sexually abusing seminarians and altar boys. An indictment is also being sought for the former rector of the Vatican St. Pius X Seminary, who is accused of aiding and abetting the crime. This case was made public in 2017 by a whistleblower who was a former seminarian. Hannah Brockhaus is closely following this story for Catholic News Agency. She joins us from Rome. Hannah, this case goes back years. Give us some background on it. Right. Well, Wyatt, it starts back around 2012 when the whistleblower, uh, Darzembowski, first made his accusations against this priest. And um, at the time, he was sort of uh, received some blowback from the church in Italy, and he was also dismissed from the seminary where he was also a student. So following that, a few years passed, and in 2017, a couple factors came into play. One was that Jarzembowski decided to go public with his accusations. Another is that a prominent Italian investigative journalist made a report in which he interviewed some of the alleged victims of Martinelli. And so following that, the Vatican agreed to conduct an investigation. That was November 2017 that they started that investigation. The Vatican also released a statement today about the case. Why did they release the statement now and what does it say? Well, the Vatican statement said that they're bringing charges against Martinelli and against another priest, Radice, 
um, for uh, against Martinelli for sexual abuse and against Radice for aiding and abetting, they said. The statement also said that the reason charges weren't brought earlier was that a trial couldn't take place because they say at the time the Vatican's law made it so that uh, the actual alleged victim would have had to come forward within a year of the alleged abuse, which hadn't taken place. He came forward much later. And so they said now, due to a special provision by Pope Francis that was made in June, they're able to go forward with that. It's very interesting to hear about that special provision, how things are changing in the way the Vatican deals with that. How, how much or has anything changed in terms of how the Vatican is handling sex abuse cases within the Vatican City? Well, there still remain a lot of questions about this case in particular. I think especially going back to 2012, people are wondering what did and didn't happen uh, when the accusations were first made. Um, but since then, in March, Pope Francis uh, issued new guidelines and laws for Vatican City State and, Roman, and the Roman Curia about protection of minors. And one of these is um, a mandatory reporting by any officials in the Roman Curia and who work inside Vatican City State. So I wonder going forward how that might have affected, had that been in place before, how that might have affected this case. Well, obviously we'll keep our eye and watching all the details in this case, see how it plays out. And also obviously we're keeping our eye on how the Vatican deals with the sex abuse crisis. And of course their handling of all of this with new rules and provisions and such. Hannah Brockhaus, Senior Rome Correspondent for Catholic News Agency. Thanks very much. Thanks Wyatt. Coming up, the Holy Father prays for victims of a disease affecting millions around the world and analysis of a study about abortions in the United States. Pope Francis prays for victims of Alzheimer's disease. Preghiamo per la conversione dei cuori e per quanti sono colpiti dall'Alzheimer. At his weekly talk with pilgrims at the Vatican, the Holy Father asked for protection for those suffering from the disease. He also asked for the conversion of hearts of those who try to take advantage of people with Alzheimer's. An estimated 50 million people worldwide have some form of the disease. Reports say the former president of Planned Parenthood is locked in a contract disagreement with the abortion giant. Dr. Lena Wynn was fired in July amid a dispute over the group's mission. She now says Planned Parenthood is refusing to give her severance pay unless she signs a non-disclosure agreement. For more on the story, including what Planned Parenthood says about Dr. Wynn's claims, visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com. New figures released today show the number and rate of abortion across the United States has plunged to their lowest levels since the Supreme Court's 1973 Roe v. Wade decision legalizing the procedure. The report from the Guttmacher Institute, a pro-abortion research group, finds there were 862,000 abortions in the United States in 2017. That's down from 926,000 abortions in the group's previous report from 2014. Join me now to offer her analysis is Tessa Longbonds, research associate with the pro-life Charlotte Lozier Institute. Tessa, welcome in. These numbers are obviously welcome news for the pro-life supporters. What do you think accounts for the decline? Well, abortions have been dropping since the 1980s, and I think the credit goes to pro-life laws to protect women and babies, and also support from the pro-life movement for women and giving them more options. It certainly has grown. Uh, as you, we take a look at that data, and I know you look at data from across the country in your work with the Charlotte Lozier Institute, what are some of the pro-life gains being made at the state level? Well, we've seen more and more laws passed to protect babies at different points in pregnancy and also to give women more information and to make sure that they are being protected as well. And obviously that's so critical. So what policy efforts would you like to see implemented to, that would support the trend? We would definitely like to see more laws that protect babies when they're capable of feeling pain. And we'd also like to see laws enforced to make sure that women aren't being endangered by dangerous chemical abortions. So give me a concrete example. I know we talked, for example, about the heartbeat bill. Is that one of the ones that you would support? And what's the benefit of that, for example? Well, of course, we'd like to see all babies protected from abortion, but we would like to see bills that could potentially make their way to the Supreme Court and provide a challenge to Roe v. Wade. Uh, this study also takes note of the decline birth rate in the U.S. Uh, how troubling is that in general, and what are some of the contributing factors? 
Well, the Guttmacher Institute always likes to credit contraception for the declining birth rate, but their latest report shows that there hasn't been much of a change in contraceptive usage, so there are many factors that could be impacting the birth rate in the U.S., and um, that is helping to contribute to lowering abortion rates as well. I know that's alarming for, for a lot of pro-lifers who are watching that. There's also concerning news within the study about the rise of medication abortions. Uh, they've account for 39 percent of all abortions in 2017. What's your reaction to that figure and what's the implication here? Well, that's definitely disturbing. That's an increase from 29 percent of all abortions in 2014. And we know these abortions have a higher complication rate than surgical abortions and are happening when the woman is at home and a doctor isn't present. So that's something, something that we're definitely watching and are very concerned about as we see these complications increasing. Why do you think this is, we've seen more and more of it? It's definitely something that the abortion industry has been pushing, and we've even seen organizations like Aid Access illegally shipping these pills to the United States outside the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's approved protocol and putting them directly into the hands of women who haven't been, who haven't received um, an examination from a doctor to make sure that they're even eligible to take these drugs. Very concerning. Um, you had mentioned before that women have not been adequately informed. What specifically are they not being informed about, whether it's the drugs or abortion itself? Well, I think many women are not aware of the risks. And in fact, there's a new website, abortiondrugfacts.com, that has stories from some women who regret taking these pills and wish they had been aware of what they were really getting themselves into. I'm, I'm guessing that's also true of abortion itself, just women who have had a procedure and then regret it afterwards. Yes, but because chemical abortion is increasing in the U.S., mm -hmm. we're definitely seeing more and more women who regret taking these pills. Okay, a lot of alarming statistics, but ones that we have to keep track of. And so we appreciate your coming on to give us some analysis of this. Tessa Longbonds, research associate with the Charlotte Lozier Institute. Glad to have you on. Thanks for having me. Up next. A senator from Indiana weighs in on the disturbing discovery at the home of an abortion doctor. <music> Lawyers at a Minnesota-based firm claim the Archdiocese of Chicago has paid $80 million to more than 150 of their clients who are victims of clergy sex abuse. One survivor says the settlements are only part of the healing process. I feel as though I've gotten a lot of my, my power back because of the fact that the church admitted that this happened. Um, they knew that my abuser was actively abusing children of my age, which I was about 11 years old um, at that time. The Archdiocese of Chicago says it will not release any details on payouts to specific law for firms or individuals. In general, though, officials say the Archdiocese has paid around $200 million to settle cases involving clergy abuse over recent decades. A U.S. Senator from Indiana is joining the calls for an investigation into the discovery of more than 2,000 baby remains at the home of an abortion doctor. We have to be responsible, we have to be methodical, but we have to be bold. And, and so the Attorney General of the state of Indiana and the Attorney General of the state of Illinois are working together on their own investigation. We also need federal authorities uh, to do all they can to get to the, uh, the bottom of this and hold everyone, everyone accountable. Republican Todd Young also says the discovery of the baby remains shocked his conscience. Young is pro-life and has voted against several pro-abortion measures. Mary Margaret Olihan, so social issues reporter at The Daily Caller, joins me now to talk more about the case. Mary Margaret, welcome in. We've been following this story all week. Where do things stand in the investigation right now? Right now, authorities are looking into whether there are any more fetal remains in his clinics, which is pretty scary to think about. Um, they're looking into his home. We don't know very much more about what's going on, but we do know that they found 2,246 medically preserved fetal remains in his home. It's pretty scary stuff. Um, obviously, we're also learning more about the doctor himself, uh, Kotfler. Uh, he died earlier this month. Tell me about what we know about him and his early life in Germany, I believe. So I actually had the privilege of talking to a documentary filmmaker yesterday, Mark Archer. Mark talked to Dr. Klopfer in October of 2018, and Klopfer told him that as a five-year-old in Germany, Klopfer witnessed the bombings of Dresden, the fire bombings. Klopfer saw people being killed, all around him, uh, prisoners of war being killed in a train, 
uh, his neighbors being killed across the street. And Klopfer told Mark that he believes that these things impacted his perception of people and the way they interact with each other, which is pretty crazy stuff. It really is crazy. I'm just trying to think about how that influence could have had on his later years and what you think about that, I mean, how it gets to this point. Right, I mean, this is a, a glimpse into the psyche of an abortion doctor that we don't really get. A lot of the time people gloss over abortion doctors and act as if they're regular doctors, but this man killed 30,000 babies during his life, at least 30,000 babies. And now we know that he himself thinks that there's a reason behind that. And, and in the wake of his death, finding all these fetal remains in his home, to find out that he thinks that this war influenced his actions is pretty fascinating stuff. It is fascinating. Uh, Democratic presidential candidate and South Bend, Indiana, Mayor Pete Buttigieg so far has not commented on this case, although there have been calls for him to do so. What would you like to hear from him? I would love to hear him comment on the situation at all. He hasn't said one word. He was mayor of South Bend, Indiana starting in 2011 when Dr. Klopfer worked at the Women's Pavilion where he had so many issues that it, he was, uh, the clinic was shut down and his license was taken away. Uh, Buttigieg was mayor of South Bend that entire time and did nothing about it and he actually supported a clinic that opened to replace the Women's Pavilion and he supported this clinic opening even though the woman in charge was uh, Klopfer's right, in, right, right hand woman initially. And obviously Buttigieg is not the only one who hasn't necessarily commented on this specific situation. Others Democrats have hesitated to say anything on it. Why do you think that is? Is there a conflict? They don't want to get their hands dirty. They don't want to talk about the realities of abortion. The reality of abortion is it's for money. They're using babies' lives in order to obtain money. And this doctor killed 30,000 babies and was paid for it by taxpayer-funded money a lot of the time, actually. And they don't want to touch this. If they touch this, they have to admit that it's gruesome, it's grisly. They don't want to deal with that. You mentioned gruesome. I mean, some have compared uh, Klopfer to Gosnell. Is that comparison fair? What do you think about that? Uh, Gosnell actually collected baby body parts, too. He stored them in milk jugs in his refrigerator. He stored them in his freezer. So this is, this is very similar. Gosnell's spending his life in prison right now on three counts of murder for snipping the necks of babies and killing them. So, yes, this is very similar to that. Okay. Well, obviously, um, some pretty disturbing stuff, but like I say, it's so important that we get all of the information and stay up to date on this uh, case and the investigation. Mary Margaret Olihan, social issues reporter at The Daily Caller, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And that wraps up our newscast for tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Wyatt Goolsby. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from a Catholic perspective. Good night and God bless. <laughs>